Good afternoon, everyone. I'm going to be talking slightly different topic, I suppose, in one sense, but I've chosen faces as an example in this talk because I think faces are fascinating. What's the most common object that you will see in your entire life? It's faces. But also, from a very technical point of view, faces are fascinating because we have very specific parts in our brain to actually look, perceive, and understand faces. So when you're designing algorithms, especially artificial intelligence algorithms, it's a challenge to actually throw these faces into these AI algorithms, especially deep learning or whatever, and then trying to challenge. So one of my kind of aims or uh, my part of my career is to try and understand, say, for example, deep learning or generative adversarial networks or whatever it is, and try and find the limits of those. So I'll tell you some of the limits of those kind of algorithms that we all tout about, for example, deep learning. We all tout about, and I tell you some of the kind of limitations and so on. But, and also part of my topic is how to identify a spy or unmask a spy. So I'll tell you some of the practical examples of face recognition that we have been actually undertaking in our lab. Um, so let me start with faces. Um, I'll start with a very simple experiment that they do on babies. So these babies, when they're first born, they do a simple experiment. So basically they hold a placard, as shown in this picture, where it's basically a circle with two eyes and a mouth. And then what they do is this baby has just come out. It hasn't seen anything, anything in the entire world. So what they do is they put this placard and star flesh in this. What happens? the baby actually starts tracking this, yeah? The baby hasn't seen anything, but the baby actually tracks this. Now, to make sure that the baby is actually looking at face-like object, what they do is they take the reverse it. So the now the eyesight, the bottom, the mouth is at the top, yeah? And they do exactly the same experiment, but the baby is not interested. So it kind of shows that we are hardwired to look at faces. And, and, and there are experiment after experiment shows that we are hardwired to actually look at faces, understand and perceive faces. So we must be very good in, in doing recognition of faces and understanding faces. So it's a very good challenge, as I said before, to throw to the computer and to see the limits of these algorithms. And also to design better algorithms, especially for image recognition. So if I show you this example, you probably know who is, yeah? I'm sure every one of you know. So it's not very hard for us to kind of, you know, looking at even parts of this, especially the eyes, to know this is Obama. Well, how do you know this is Obama? Because you, you probably haven't seen Obama in real life, but you've seen him on TV several times, on, on newspapers and other things. So you know what Obama looks like. And this is very interesting in one sense when we're designing artificial intelligence algorithms that for someone, for us to actually understand a perceive an object, we only have to show a very small proportion of it. Let's say a two-year-old child, you want to teach the two-year-old child how to recognize apples. So what do you do? You just show like an apple or a couple of apples. And that's really enough for the two-year-old to understand an apple. You probably show a green apple to the two-year-old, say this is an apple or even a car. And the two-year-old actually understands. But if you want to teach a machine to try and explain what an apple is, you probably have to show a million apples before it can even understand what an apple is. So there is actually a big problem. And we talk about data and all this. There is actually a huge problem in kind of even deep learning in, in machine learning algorithms. So I'll touch upon it. So that's Obama. But let me show you this picture. Are they identical twins? Any thoughts? For some of you might be thinking, oh, I'm not sure, are these identical twins? They are actually not identical twins. These are basically people that they source around, uh, and, uh, and most of it is actually makeup. If you, see. if you actually look very closely, you will see that there are differences. They are not, they, they're called twin strangers, by the way. 
they don't even know each other. So these people are kind of living in different parts of the world and they seem to kind of find people who look alike. And obviously they throw in makeup and this like to make sure that. So now this is a very interesting challenge for a face recognition system. Throw these images and find out whether they are the same people. For us, when we look at, you know, it looks like they're the same people, yeah? So what I want to do is, I want to spend a bit of time, you probably might know what uh, machine learning, deep learning is, maybe you don't. But let me try and explain how actually these things work in, in kind of, you know, because day in and day out in our lab, what we do is we train these algorithms, especially face recognition, facial emotions. Uh, we have a big uh, lab where we actually have a few um, members of staff working specifically on faces. So I will explain to you how we actually train these things uh, in a sense. So let's just say deep learning, okay, in face recognition. As I said before, if you have a two-year-old, if you want to teach a two-year-old how to recognize objects, what you do is you show this two-year-old or five-year-old some objects. And, and you keep reinforcing sometimes, you keep showing more and more. So this is exactly what we do in face recognition. So you have a face, okay? What you do is you show a picture of the face to the machine. Now, for the machine, the algorithm, this is actually not a face as, as we perceive. It's just an image. Yeah? So what we do is we keep reinforcing, we show different types of faces, same person, but we keep showing it, keep showing it thousands, thousands, millions, and tens of millions, probably, yeah? And after a while, goes through this. So basically, um, it goes through these layers. Each layer actually extracts some features. So one layer might actually look at the color space. Uh, and the other layer might look at the shape, the other layer might look at the texture, so on and so forth, and it basically brings it down to a series of numbers. So in the current face recognition system that we have in our lab, you can encode basically any human face using just a mere 128 numbers. So basically, if I get your face, all I do is I look at your face, I encode it by using 128 floating eight point numbers. Now you might be asking how did the machine actually know, come up with the 128 numbers? I don't know. It just figured it by itself. And this is where the black box type deep learning or machine learning is kind of mind boggling for us because we don't know exactly how it figured it out. So what we know is when we showed millions and millions of faces to it, it actually came to realize, hang on, this is a face. I know this. Yeah? Exactly how it did, we don't know. Now, if you actually take the analogy of the same thing in human brain, I don't know how I recognize faces, do I? Do you know how you recognize faces? Or do you know how you recognize a specific person as opposed to someone else? We don't know. So similarly, the algorithms are doing in a similar way. But obviously, there are ethical questions to ask because how do you trust to actually deploy a face recognition system like this in an airport scenario to identify people? Because we don't really know how it works. It's a black box. But all I know is 99, close to 100% of the time, it actually works. So imagine you have a frontal face, my face, and I have my face already trained in my algorithm. I come tomorrow, you take a picture of me, and then I test whether this, my face exists in that database. If it's a frontal face, it's 100% of the time it will pull that out in our algorithm. We know that. We know that for sure it works. Now, this database can be a million faces. It doesn't really matter. It will pull it out. Now, ask a human to do that. That's an impossible task for a human to do. If you have a million faces in the database, you can't learn those faces. It's an impossible task. But the machine does it. So the question, the sort of ethical question here is, how does it actually know these 128 numbers are the, the most accurate or all the ones? But from experiments, we know that it works. So. Here's an example. Here's, um, this is how we verify our, our face recognition system. So you can see here uh, that the images around are the images of Queen. Um, some, of the, some of the images, if, you, if I showed you, I mean, Queen is the most photographed person in the entire world, I guess. But if you look at this, you can probably see um, some of the images you can't recognize, but some you can. But in our algorithm, when we test it, it does it you know, all the time. So 70% or above is an identity match, by the way. 
if you have two phases sim in our algorithm, if it takes uh, two phases, if the um, so similarity is 70 and higher, it means it's an identity match. So in all these cases, we get 70% or higher. So that means our algorithm is performing quite well, as you can see. So some of these images, for example, you can't actually see the difference. And here, here again, in our algorithm, we can actually take these twin strangers, we can also distinguish between them. So you can see they are below kind of 70%, so we know that they are not the same person. So this is how we apply our algorithm. But we also do something similar, um, something, uh, some other thing called face aging on faces. So the idea here is, let's say you're given a passport for 10 years. By the ninth year, you don't look anything like that passport. Well, in some cases, you don't, most, most of the time. So one of the things that we do is we actually perceive what the person would look like in, in few years down the line. How do we do it? We take a large data set, just like uh, how we train the face recognition. We take a large data set of different ethnicities, and then what we do is we train it. So for example, Caucasian white male, age 30. We take a large sample, we throw that data into the algorithm and say this is how a Caucasian white male, a typical male, will look like. And the computer will understand it. And after a while we have an algorithm which is actually an aging algorithm. So then you can take a new face, you can age progress, or, or you can actually uh, make it forward or go backwards. So then you will be asking a question, so this is Princess Charlotte, we did, and this is our prediction of what she would look like in years to come. Now you might be asking the question, how do you know this is accurate? Well, it's actually very easy for us to do. So what we do is we take an image, and then we can de-age that person. So for example, take my, my face, I can de-age, and then take the, my older version of a real picture, and then I do, can do face recognition between them. If the face recognition test passes, then I know my algorithm is OK. So this is how we do it. So what are the applications? Obviously, face recognition is well known. We know that it's, it's Im implemented in immigration scenarios and other things. But we have been using it for very high profile cases. So for example, here, this is uh, um, the Salisbury uh, poisoning case where I have been asked to, I've been given basically two pictures and said, are these the same people? So basically what we did is we actually used our face recognition algorithm, we used aging algorithm as well to try and make sure or, or, or confirm at least that these are the same people. Uh, this is actually done for Bellingcat, uh, the online investigator, by the way. And in similar way, we actually look at the second person in the second suspect in the um, in Salisbury um, poisoning case as well. We confirmed their identity again it, between these two images. There's about 15 years of difference. So we did the aging, and then we verified that this is the person. Um, then the, the, the percentages that we will be going in and the high 90s. Obviously, you need to get something like 70% to ensure that's a kind of an identity image. And, and recently, we even looked at the third person in, in, in this case. Uh, so again, these are very blurry pictures, but we can actually identify that that's the same person using our face matching algorithm. We have also recently worked on, uh, for the New York Times on the Khashoggi case, where we had an identity, and then we were asked to actually try and see uh, how do we match it. So there's been quite a lot of practical examples of face recognition work that we do in our labs. Now you might be wondering, so in terms of kind of my understanding of faces, um, we are still at the very beginning. You know, okay, we can have every million, piece, million faces in a database and we can have a frontal face, we can recognize that person for, for sure. If we had two images, we can for sure say this is the same person or not. That's fine. But the real question for us is actually things like deep learning or, or reinforcement learning or, or for that matter other algorithms is really you have a grainy CCTV image of a person like somebody's nose, and then you have 10 million faces in your database. Whether that person exists in that or not, that is the question that we want to ask. And that's the real power of machine learning, and I think those are the things that are coming forth. And those are the things that are, we, we are working. And, and when I start working on those kind of problems, I start realizing the actual limitations of deep learning, for example. So I don't personally believe that deep learning is the solution going forward. We don't have any other thing, by the way. Deep learning is the only thing. It's, it's, so this is what I call um, kind of artificial intelligence. It's actually one trick pony at the moment. It's just deep learning at the moment. But I think uh, sort of deep learning has its limitations. And um, I think somebody has to find out some new 
technique to try and get to kind of, you know, this band of narrow, narrow artificial intelligence. Yes, it works for narrow artificial intelligence, but to go beyond that, we need something else. And somebody somewhere will find something brilliant, um, and there's a Nobel Prize to be won. Thank you. Uh, and any questions that you would like to ask any of the, uh, the, the speakers? What's your view on the way policing has been using technology? That's a very good question. So I hear all these stories about the, I don't know whether it's Metropolitan Police or Wales Police in Wales, that they, their recognition system is like... Uh, so, so the question is, what's my view on the recent uh, stories about face recognition and how inaccurate it is, I suppose. Is that the question? Yeah, I suppose, yeah. <laughs> so, yes, there's been quite a lot of stories about how inaccurate face recognition is. It's, it's less than 40%, it's 40%. That's less than flipping coins. You might as well decide flip a coin and decide then actually using the, the kind of algorithm. But my point is, I don't actually know what, what face recognition systems to start with they're using. I think it's probably the wrong way of using it. So as I said, if you, if you have, let's say, 80 million people as faces, just like maybe a frontal face or part of the face, and then you have a grainy CCTV image of that person in trying, you're trying to recognize, now that's a very difficult task. And I wouldn't be surprised if you get 40% in that. You know? So I think, first of all, we need to understand face recognition and the limitations of it, the limitations, this is the limitation, and this is not a sole problem, you know. This, the only sole problem in face recognition, as far as I'm concerned, is what we call one-to-one -one matching. If you have a face, if you have a, a frontal face in a database, that, you know, matching to that or pulling out that face is a sole problem. I would be very surprised any algorithm, well, any reliable algorithm feel fair that. But, as I said, I think that is the problem, so we pr probably be using the algorithms in the wrong way, or we don't, or, or, or we don't have enough data to train the algorithms properly. The extractive features on the on the face, so there are some possibly less than a hundred features. We don't do that anymore. Do you really? No, because it's it's all techniques, and it doesn't work that well. Um, we don't do that. This is why all we do is we take your face. We just throw it to the machine, the algorithm, the alg let the algorithm figure out which 128 parameters to extract. We don't really know. We don't even care about that. Because what you're saying is our rule-based, and you can't apply that rule-based to 8 billion people. You know, that's very difficult. So this is why we, we have already moved away from that, and this is why we give the power to the machine, to the algorithm, so the machine figures it out by itself. So, for example, uh, my, my guess is Facebook has the most powerful face recognition algorithm in the entire world. Why? Because they have the most access to the faces. It's very simple. Probably better than more than any other government. So yeah, their, their algorithm will be very, very powerful. Yes. Very good question. So the qu yeah, I think if I understand correctly, do I have an algorithm to identify identical twins? Or can my machine learning, with the way I have trained, can I identify identical twins? The question is no. I can't. I mean, I have, I'm being honest. Actually, this is something that we are working at the moment. So given two faces, frontal, you know, identical twins, can I tell them that part? Uh, my algorithm can't. Those 128 numbers that I extract, from identical twins, they are very alike. They, they, you know, it will actually, you know, most of the time it will fail. But we are working on an algorithm at the moment to try. I, I can't describe, I can't explain it at the moment because it's, it doesn't work at the moment. Basically, what we're trying to use is, I don't know if you know about GANs, generative adversarial network. So what these things does is it actually creates lots of copies, very look-alike copies of that. So what we, our idea is. Given two identical twins, we will create maybe thousands and thousands of copies of each and then start comparing them. Maybe we might have an answer. But no, the answer is I can't at the moment. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah, Thank brilliant you. job. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah.